Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about substitution reactions. Specifically, we're going to be discussing SN2 reactions. All right, so let's just take a look at the basic reaction here. I'm going to start with an alkyl halide. All right, and what we'll notice with our alkyl halide here is that our alkyl halide is going to serve as our leaving group. So our chlorine hal will our chlorine will be our LG or our leaving group. All right, and alkyl halides are good leaving groups because the carbon halogen bond is somewhat weak. What we'll be doing basically is adding a nucleophile, okay, some nucleophile, something with a lone pair. This is generally charged. And then a specific solvent that re will really help favor the SN2 reaction. So you'll see in this reaction that there's going to be three main solvents we use that really favor formation. All right. And then we have a good nucleophile for the reaction to work. And it's quite simple, actually, right? The nucleophile is simply going to replace the leaving group, right? That's a substitution reaction, right? So you'll see our nucleophile will displace our alkyl halide, our leaving group, all right? The solvents that work well, that help favor the SN2 reactions, there's three main solvents that we'll talk about. First is DMF or DMSO or acetone. So these are the three main solvents that are used in the SN2 reaction. DMF stands for dimethylformamide. Okay, dimethylformamide. And that's what that structure looks like. DMSO is dimethyl sulfoxide. And acetone is a simple ketone. So these are the three main solvents that we'll be using when we run these reactions. And these are all very, very good indicators that you are in fact going to run or um, do an SN2 reaction. Okay, so let's look at a, a specific example here and, a, and then go through the mechanism. So I'll take my alkyl bromide. I'm gonna treat this with NaOH in DMF, NaOH in DMF, okay? So again, NaOH, our hydroxide ion, will act as our nucleophile, and you'll see this is a good nucleophile because it's charged, right? And our bromine is going to be our leaving group, all right? So here, Na plus OH minus, right? Uh, this will completely dissociate to give you sodium plus and OH minus. OH minus is going to act as our nucleophile. And then DMF is our solvent, a good indicator that we're running the SN2. The mechanism is very straightforward. One of the lone pairs on the O is going to attack the carbon that's connected to the bromine, and then you're going to break the carbon-bromine bond. Okay, so this is a one-step mechanism, all right? One-step mechanism, and we are simply going to replace that alkyl halide with OH, right? And we've now made an alcohol as our final product. So pretty straightforward here. Okay, we've done just a simple SN2 reaction. Um, so let's just put a few notes over here, right? about the SN2 first solvent we want to use DMF DMSO or acetone second this is a one step mechanism okay this is a one step mechanism all right um one thing i'd like to do is now talk about the mechanism um a, a little bit um, and specifically look at this step, right? So there's one step, which means this is, there's only one step that is our rate determining step. And I just want to take a look at, at, um, this mechanism in a little more detail. 
So what you'll notice here is this carbon, right, that carbon is a connected to one carbon and two hydrogens, right? So this is a primary alkyl halide. And this reaction definitely proceeds well with a primary alkyl halide. It's in fact quite fast. But if you think about this mechanism, right, this lone pair has to form a new bond to this carbon. So if we have bulk, if we have lots of groups around this carbon here, that can really slow up the reaction. And in fact, if there's too much there, then the reaction won't proceed, okay? So primary alkyl halides definitely work, as do secondary alkyl halides, right? So if I take a secondary alkyl halide and we do the reaction here, let's take a different nucleophile. We'll take NaOET and we'll run our solvent in DMSO. Right, so our OET minus is going to be our strong nucleophile. We're doing the mechanism here, attack the carbon, break the carbon-chlorine bond, right? And we've now formed an ether as our product. So the reaction proceeds quite well, again, when you have secondary alkyl halides, okay? But what you'll see is if you have a tertiary alkyl halide, so if we have something like this, and we try to run the SN2 reaction, right? So we'll take another nucleophile. Again, we'll just use NaOH uh, in DMF. What you'll see is that this reaction won't work, all right? This lone pair wants to attack this carbon, but there's too much bulk, right? We've got the carbon we're trying to attack. We have three other carbons around it, and it's blocking that face. So when this is a tertiary alkyl halide, the SN2 reaction will not proceed. It doesn't work, right? It's too slow of a, of a reaction. Okay, so what we have to remember here, if we kind of look at our side notes here, is that primary alkyl halides are faster than secondary alkyl halides, and that's much faster than tertiary alkyl halides, whereas the tertiary alkyl halides won't react. All right, so our SN2 reaction can only really proceed if we have a, if we have a primary or secondary leaving group, a primary secondary alkyl halide. They will not work if it's tertiary. So that SN2 reaction will not work, all right? Continuing in the reaction, let's, um, let's look at this a little, in a little more detail. What I wanna do here is sort of look at our transition state, okay? So this is a one-step reaction, a one-step mechanism, right? So if you think about our energy diagram here, there's only going to be one hump, right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at our transition state, all right? And that's the state where the OET is beginning to attack and the chlorine is beginning to leave, all right? So what I'm going to do here is draw in my carbon, There's a CH3 attached to one side, a CH3 attached to the other, okay? And then we have an H, and then we have our leaving group, the CL, all right? And what I want to do here is I want to draw in the orbitals around this carbon, specifically the orbital that's connected to the chlorine. So that carbon is sp3 hybridized, right? So this carbon-chlorine bond is a sigma bond with two sp3 orbitals. So this is a sigma bond, right? And that sigma bond is a carbon sp3 to a chlorine sp3, all right? So when we think about our, our nucleophile coming in, right? We used OET minus, ETO minus. My question is, where do these electrons go, right? How is this carbon a good electrophile? 
how is this carbon a good electrophile, right? Our ETO minus is a good nucleophile, right? But where do these electrons go? So I have three lone pairs here, all right? Three lone pairs here. Where do the electrons go? So if you look at this carbon, right, it's got a full octet. There is no empty orbitals. It's not a Lewis acid. It's completely full. So where can we put the electrons? What's interesting about this is that in blue, what I've drawn here in blue, that is my sp3 hybridized orbital, okay? That's full of electrons, so elect electrons can't go in there. But if we remember, anytime we form a bond, we also have an antibond, an antibonding orbital. So while we have this carbon in blue, right, while we have this orbital here in blue, right, that sigma bond, we also have an antibonding orbital that goes in the opposite direction. So I'm going to draw that in red here. So in red, I now have an antibonding orbital. Okay, so we can call this a sigma star. So that sigma star is in the exact opposite direction of the blue bond. All right, and this sigma star is an empty orbital. It's high in energy and it's an empty orbital. So when our ETO minus is forming a bond to the carbon, it's actually forming a bond into that antibonding orbital, which then forces these two electrons out onto the chlorine, all right? And we call this backside attack, backside attack. And anytime we have an SN2 reaction, for every SN2 reaction, we always have a backside attack meaning that this lone pair is going to form a new bond to the antibonding orbital. And then this bonding orbital is going to become a lone pair in the chlorine, which means that then that carbon will form our new bond to our nucleophile, our OE t in the opposite direction so with the sn2 reaction we always have backside attack meaning our nucleophile is now adding on the opposite side of where the leaving group was okay so let's go put our little note over here and just erase our little energy diagram okay so what we need to do here is write that we have backside attack. Okay. And let's think about the consequence of that. And the consequence we really need to think about is stereochemistry. So if you look at the examples we looked at here, right, that was not a stereocenter. This was not a stereocenter. But what happens if we do have a stereocenter? Okay. So I'm going to draw another example here. Now I'm going to have my leaving group as a stereocenter. So we'll add a bromine here. We're going to take a nucleophile. Again, a good nucleophile is anything that has a charge, anything that has a minus sign. So normally, we always want that to be neutral overall. So we can have Na and then our nucleophile. So now I'm going to use NaSCH3. Okay, sulfur is right below oxygen on the periodic table, so that means you have an S minus. Okay, again, we want to use a solvent that favors the SN2 reaction, DMF, DMSO, or acetone. And let's look what happens in this reaction here. Okay, so we know we're going to replace our leaving group, right? Our bromine is going to get kicked out with our nucleophile. So let's draw the mechanism here. Again, sulfur is right below oxygen on the periodic table, so this means we have an S minus, and that's going to be our nucleophile. Okay, so here, when we have backside attack, we attack opposite of the bromine, kick that bond out. So if we have backside attack and attack opposite the bromine, what that means is our nucleophile is now going to be adding with the opposite stereochemistry. Right, so what this means is we have inversion of 
of stereochemistry. So if you have stereochemistry at the carbon that you're attacking, at the electrophilic carbon, you're then going to have inversion of stereochemistry. If there's another stereocenter here, that's not uh, impacting the reaction at all. So inversion of stereochemistry only happens right at the electrophilic carbon. At the electrophilic carbon. Okay, so let's put that as another um, note here. Backside attack means we have inversion of stereochemistry. Inversion of stereochemistry. All right. And there's kind of two ways to show this, right? This carbon in blue, we've inverted the stereochemistry, right? So our bromine was a wedge, which means our nucleophile is now a dash. I'll show you sort of another example here. So let's say we have a stereocenter. Let's put a methyl here. Okay, so here's the carbon with our leaving group. Let's add a good nucleophile, NaOH in DMF. So I'm not going to draw the mechanism in here, but what we know is that our OH is going to replace our bromine, right? But we have to remember that we had to invert this stereochemistry. So in the top example here, if the bromine was a dash or a wedge, then our nucleophile is the opposite. Okay, here, because we had a methyl, we've got to invert that. So that methyl now becomes a dash. All right, so again, this is a methyl. That methyl now has opposite stereochemistry here. Okay, so we can either show it by having our leaving group and our nucleophile change, or if I put my nucleophile in the same place where the leaving group was, then I need to make sure I change that stereocenter. All right, so there's two ways to really show our inversion of stereochemistry here. All right. Um, great. So the last thing we really want to talk about is where does the two come from? Right, so we've talked about E2 reactions and E1 reactions, SN2 now. So what does that mean? The two means that this is a second order reaction. Our reaction is second order. Okay, so we can calculate our rate law. Our rate equals K times, right, the two things that react, right? So if we look at this example here, what's reacting? Our alkyl halide and our nucleophile. So our rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of our alkyl halide times the concentration of our nucleophile. So here we could write NaOH if you wanted to. You could also just write HO minus, either one. All right, so this is our rate law, all right? And when we talked about the E2 reaction, we sort of understood, right, if I double the concentration of my alkyl halide only, my rate would double. If I double the concentration of my alkyl halide and of my nucleophile, if I double both of these, the rate would be four times as much, right? Or if I reduced my solvent by half, let's say I ran this reaction with 20 mils of DMF. If I rerun it with 10 mils of DMF, what happens, right? These are concentrations that means that that concentration has doubled, that concentration has doubled, so our rate is four times as much. All right. So let's add that as our second note here. Okay. Our second note is that the reaction is second order. All right. So that's the SN2 reaction, right? The main things we kind of want to remember here, each piece. Solvent is very important. DMF, DMSO, or acetone. It's a one-step mechanism. The reaction works for primary and secondary alkyl halides, but not tertiary. We have backside attack. So if you have a stereocenter, it has to get inverted, and this reaction is second order.